sign-up sheet going around? Uh, is everybody signed up? Um, we'll start in a couple minutes, but before we start, I want to say a couple things about the group that founded this lecture series. It's called the Global Issues Working Group. And it's just a, it's a group of faculty, uh, staff, and students, even some administrators are involved in this group. And uh, Aisha uh, was kind of one of the inspirations for the group. Uh, I saw her give a lecture last spring, and I thought, you know, we need to bring this to a wider audience and to uh, kind of a, a more prominent place in the university. And uh, so the, the Global Issues Working Group is uh, working on critical global issues uh, you know, issues that are important to the world and uh, might be critical in terms of, you know, the stuff that's coming up, a time frame, or critical in terms of the scale of the problem. Uh, so uh, the Global Issues Working Group is having its first meeting this Friday at 1130. And you all are invited, so that's the fantastic part. We want students to be involved. And so the meeting, so you can get your phones out and put this down on your calendar now. The Global Issues Working Group is going to have its first meeting, and it will be at 11.30 this Friday. It's actually on Pipeline Road. Is it on? Okay. But uh, this, I don't think this particular meeting is on Pipeline. Come on in. There, folks, there's a sign-up sheet going around. Make sure you sign in. Come on in. And then there's, there's food over in the conference room if you're hungry. Uh, and so it, the, uh, the meeting time is 11.30. It's going to take place uh, Friday, 11.30 at uh, UB 800. Okay. UB building is the one over this direction. Uh, it's got some classrooms on the second floor. Well, that, it's, the, it's the first floor is by undergraduate. Okay. Admissions, the second floor. So you're all invited to that meeting as well. And if you have more questions uh, about that, you certainly can talk to me. Uh, you can email me. My email is jdavidn at hpu.edu. Okay, so we want we want you all to come and participate in that. Uh, and as, as more people begin to filter in here, uh, we will start here in a second. Uh, yeah, so folks who haven't signed up yet, signed in. Everybody who hasn't signed in yet. Okay, and then just, just, I think there's some folks on that side who haven't signed in yet, so I'll have them sign in as well. There's some chairs around here if anybody needs a chair. So there's three chairs at the right now. Yeah. Or if you're really flexible, you can sit uh, on the floor. And, and if you feel comfortable, you can, you can sit here. You can sit on the floor, it's safe. Okay, that's what actually a lot of folks do for these lecture series. They'll, they'll sit on the floor. So, um, see, there's um, a little more chairs. That chair has a body in it. That's not gonna work. Anyway, so uh, grab a seat if you can, and if not, grab a, pull up a piece of carpet on the floor, and uh, we'll start here. <coughs> there's another chair over here. So we're very excited to start our Global Issues Lecture Series by uh, starting with Dr. Aisha Nibby, who will be talking about uh, Coney 2012. You're all familiar with that, right? Yeah. And so she's going to update us on issues in Central Africa and on Coney 2012. And we're delighted to have Dr. Nibby on our staff here at HPU. She's an expert in Central Africa. She will also be doing some lecturing this fall at uh, the, in the University of California system, so we're, we're delighted and grateful that she was willing to give this inaugural lecture of the Global Issues Lecture Series. Let's welcome Dr. Aisha Nibi. So thank you and welcome. Thank you for coming. Um, as uh, you just heard, this is the beginning of my 2012 tour for fall 2012, so I'm going to be hitting UCLA next, UC Irvine, and then I'm going to Philadelphia, so God knows where after that. So <laughs> so if you have any comments or, or suggestions or, or you know things that you'd like to hear uh, or you would have liked to have heard in this talk, please let me know so I can improve that. So um, yeah, 
yeah, as you guys know, and I, I remember a few of you from last semester's talk, uh, Joseph Coney came to the attention of the world in March of this year uh, with the release of Coney 2012, which was the fastest spreading viral video uh, ever. It got 100 million views in 10 days. So Invisible Children, the producers of the video, wanted to make uh, uh, wanted to make Joseph Coney famous. So in April, I gave a talk uh, to answer the question, who is Joseph Coney? Well, I'll address that question today, especially for those of you who weren't here, who weren't at the talk in April, uh, and want to know who this person is. Um, in this talk, I'm going to ask uh, another question. Six months later, does 2012, 2012 matter? So let me first introduce myself um, and tell you why uh, questions about Joseph Coney or Coney 2012 is of importance to me. Um, as you just heard, I'm an anthropologist. I'm an assistant professor here at HBU. And I graduated last year from the University of California at Davis. Um, and during my PhD, I conducted research in northern Uganda. Uh, so northern Uganda is uh, most famous as the site of the longest running conflict in Africa, 26 years, okay? And as you see here on this uh, slide, you can see this is Uganda here, and it's kind of surrounded by countries that are known famous for sort of being a, areas of conflict. Sudan, uh, the Congo, Rwanda, and Kenya, okay? So it's kind of in Somalia, it's not far away as well. So it's kind of in this area that's kind of rife with, with conflict. Um, so my study focused on uh, the effects of uh, humanitarian aid interventions in areas of conflict in Africa. And my specific sort of informal question was, what happens when a bunch of international organizations descend on a dusty, uh, out of the way African trading center um, in, in seemingly kind of the middle of nowhere, okay? So my research started in 2006 when the conflict was ongoing um, and, you know, security issues were uh, my kind of number one issue, keeping my research assistants and people like that safe and myself. Um, then we, uh, in late 2006, we moved into peace talks. And peace talks continued uh, throughout most of my research period. Um, and in 2008, uh, the peace talks fell apart and I left a few months later. So I was in the field for about two and a half years. Um, it most, you know, and it was, you know, during the time of conflict and, and peace talks. And so I had several sites uh, of research during that time uh, to get a sense of this sort of regional question, yeah? So uh, some of those sites included uh, Northern Uganda, of course, uh, Kampala, which is the capital city where a lot of donor meetings are held, South Sudan, okay? Um, but also my sort of main site was Gulu, which is the main trading center in Northern Uganda. Okay, it's the largest trading center there. I also lived in Opit um, IDP camp. IDP stands for Internally Displaced Person, okay? Uh, what's the difference between an IDP camp and a refugee camp, or an IDP and a refugee. Say it again. A refugee by choice. Okay, uh, maybe they can, it could be by choice, but usually it's forced by a situation, right? Either way, displacements are always generally forced by a situation, or a shock to an economic shock, a shock, a political shock, something like that. Same thing for a refugee, right? Refugee international. Sort of. That's getting more towards it. So a refugee is a person who is displaced outside of national borders. Okay? An IDP is a person who's displaced within national borders. Okay? And the reason that distinction is important is because if you're displaced outside of your national borders, then the UN has jurisdiction over you. You're a stateless person. Okay? An IDP the UN still has to adhere and 
be in connection and be in dialogue with the nation under which those people are displaced. Okay? So, as I said earlier, um, I left uh, Northern Uganda in 2008. And so I was lucky enough this past uh, summer to return to Northern Uganda after a four year absence. So I wrote my dissertation and then I came here and so it's been four years now. <laughs> Um, that I wasn't able to go back. So this is uh, a picture from this summer, and these were some of my informants in that used to be in Opiate IDP camp. They're now resettled. And this is a picture of me uh, receiving one of um, a zillion chickens I got um, this summer. <laughs> so I got so many chickens that I, they had to set up a chicken coop for me in the in the courtyard of my hotel. So <laughs> it's kind of funny. <laughs> so. Okay, so Gulu now is a, really a bustling town, a lot more than when I first got there in 2006. Um, it is uh, full of people from all over the region. I heard so many different languages and people wearing kind of different kinds of dresses and things like that than I saw in the past. Uh, the road to Juba, which is in the capital of South Sudan, was once completely desolate and one of the most dangerous places to go, yeah, especially at night. Um, now it is, uh, you know, jam-packed with traffic day in and day out, okay? Um, I, I really honestly couldn't even walk on the road anymore because I was getting choked with dust and it was an exhaust and things like that. Um, in addition to that, in part because of all the aid money that came into northern Uganda, there are uh, lots of uh, what I would call skyscrapers for Gulu but sort of eight-story buildings, hotels, and things like that. And uh, and I heard while I was there from a banker that Uganda, uh, Northern Uganda, Gulu has the uh, second largest number, uh, a, a sort of uh, amount of bank deposits in the country, okay? So there's a lot of money in there that was a result of the humanitarian aid intervention there. Okay, there are, are signs of war if you look for them. Now this is a picture of uh, a, a wall in a house of a friend of mine. Now while I was, actually the hotel I was staying in is actually a little guest house and the people that run that place uh, had this house out in uh, what was then a camp and now is a sort of a village, yeah? Um, and uh, I think it was Paicho, if I remember correctly. So, um, so anyways, I'd heard about this house and they told me that the LRA the rebels were using their house as an outpost for a local base of operations. So when we got there, uh, I, I went to, they went inside the house. It was late, it was dark, so we had to use a flashlight to take these pictures. But uh, but there were scribbles all over, not, naughty scribbles, I might say, if you can see those pictures, um, <laughs> that that were all over the walls, yeah? And, uh, and it was kind of interesting, and I thought, and a lot of them had sort of sexual innuendo and stuff like that, and I, was interested when I saw that because I, th I said, wow, this is probably the kind of stuff that rebels and soldiers do everywhere in the world, right? When they're stuck in a bunker or something like that, they probably scribble stuff on the wall and, you know, that kind of thing. So it was really interesting to see that and kind of look at the messages and things they had left, what they were thinking about. But for the most part, now I had lived through part of the conflict, so I was kind of accustomed to this place during a time of conflict. But for the most part, you can go to Gulu now and kind of not even know that a war even happened, okay? In a sense, people want to kind of move on right now. This is, a, I think, a motive, a method of a strategy for survival, yeah? So, as for Coney 2012, um, I only met one person and one sign of, uh, or you know, sign or evidence of of Kony 2012 in, in Gulu or in Northern Uganda in general. I met this young guy who's in his 20s, and he was wearing a Kony 2012 pendant. Well, I've been Kony 2012 centric all uh, spring, so I immediately zeroed in on that. And I'm sitting here and listening to this guy and thinking, "This is weird. This is the first time I've heard someone talking about this." And and then I looked at him and I realized who he was. He was the star of the video. And an employee of Invisible Children. Okay, I almost passed out. I almost asked for his autograph. But, <laughs> okay, but, but for the most part, then, 
uh, Gulu really, in northern Uganda, really is a 2012 free zone. Okay? It really was uh, non existent there. Okay? So, this is why I raised the question, and I raised this question mostly for myself uh, Does County 2012 matter? Okay? Uh, so, for me at least, I feel like for people in the region, I'm not so sure about that, okay? Um, perhaps not much, if at all, right? Um, if the people there don't seem to be paying too much attention to this, uh, you know, there's, it raises a question about the importance of it, right? Now, obviously, people don't have access to the internet, but people hear about stuff anyways, right? So it raises a question. And, and, and to be honest with you, it kind of I kind of lost my steam about talking about this, so I had to really get myself up for this talk today. Um, and that's why I'm asking this question, does it matter? So I kind of shifted my focus a little bit in part because of that, right? Um, but I will add to this that I do still think it matters, and it matters for people in the US and Europe who are really the targets of social marketing like this, okay? So, why do I say that? I say this because County 2012 is an exemplary case of what has been called the missionary or white savior industrial complex, okay? Which can be defined as a desire to satiate one's own desire to help with little or no knowledge about the situation or context, okay? This white savior industrial complex is uh, steeped in racialized uh, colonial notions of Africa as a bizarre, exotic place without history, okay? Um, and somehow we get the idea that it's our burden uh, the, for people in the West to go and save Africans from themselves, okay? This, uh, the ideology behind this, this complex also is steeped in uh, colonial era rooted guilt, okay? Uh, which I joke is now commonly called international development. <laughs> so in a sense, tweeting about uh, Coney 2012 is a way that one can assuage your guilt about overconsumption, over extraction, and dumping on the third world, okay? It's, uh, as Keiju Cole puts it, it's having a big emotional experience that validates your privilege. Even a top person at Invisible Children uh, admitted to me that, uh, and acknowledges the tendency of their followers of having this complex, calling it missional masturbation, okay? <laughs> because they come to help, but they end up just gratifying that desire and end up not really producing anything in the end. Okay, so one might ask, okay, what's the, what's the, what's the, what's the harm in missional masturbation, right? Um, as long as there's no one's done any harm and, you know, maybe somebody learned something. Something, and maybe something good might come of it. Well, here's the problem. Good hearts and intentions don't allow a person to connect the dots and see patterns of power that cause humanitarian crisis, okay? So because of this, this allows to persist or reinforces social systems and institutions that cause the problem in the first place, okay? So part of what I wanna do today is I wanna connect those dots for you a little bit. And I'm going to do that today by, again, asking that question in, in a, a bridged version of what I talked about uh, about six months ago, but who is this guy, Joseph Kony? And then I want to his contextualize and historicize the conflict in northern Uganda. And last, I want to talk again and kind of tie this up and talk about, you know, does this matter at all? <clears throat> okay. So, First of all, who the heck is this guy? Well, at the base level, 
He's the head of the Lord's Resistance Army. The Lord's Resistance Army is a rebel group um, in northern Uganda that is fighting against the government of Uganda. Okay. Um, he's from Odek, which is a village that's very, very close to the camp that I lived in, Okid. Okay. So I know that area very well. Um, it was a very, very hot area during the conflict. Um, uh, humanitarian aid organizations and UN vehicles were not allowed to go there without uh, a two-car convoy in, and their military uh, escorts. So it was a very hot area. Now, little, very little is known about uh, Joseph Kony prior to the LRA. Um, the lore is that he was a, an altar boy, and uh, he, uh, when he was a, a young adult, uh, was said to uh, become possessed by a spirit while sitting under a mango tree in Odek. And, uh, and, and the spirit led him to pick up uh, what was a, an already existing but faltering insurgency okay, in northern Uganda against the government of Uganda. So according to Invisible Children and the dominant discourse about this conflict, Joseph Kony is uh, a madman. Uh, a bizarre, elusive character, uh, and, he's, and he's so elusive that there's hardly any pictures of, uh, uh, of him prior to 2006 when the peace talks started. And, he, and he's so elusive that invisible children, as you saw in that first picture I showed you, he t they tend to uh, uh, illustrate him in uh, cartoon form, okay? Um, so he kind, of, he kind of takes on a sort of mythological, fictitious character kind of persona, yeah? The, the notion that he was uh, possessed by a spirit also adds to the bizarreness, particularly for people in the West, uh, while in northern Uganda that actually lends some credibility to his stance because it seems like his spirits have some power if the insurgency has been in, in place for 26 years. So the most common story about uh, Joseph Kony and the LRA is that um, the LRA wants to overthrow the government of Uganda and institute a rule of law based on the Ten Commandments. Now this last bit about the Ten Commandments is particularly galling to me because it reinforces a notion that the conflict is senseless yeah, and devoid of political purpose or substance. Uh, they're said to abduct and violently indoctrinate children, to kill, loot, and commit atrocities like cutting off ears, lips, and noses of their victims. And this is interesting. All this is done for no reason, except to institute the Ten Commandments, yeah? So if this is a killing rampage, how did this go on for 26 years? That's my first question I would ask. The second question I would ask is why the focus on children? Okay, aren't the adults victims too? Why do you keep hearing about kids? So to buy the story, you need to walk in with a certain set of assumptions. One assumption is that Africans are violent, barbaric, and irrational. Two, that Africa is a place without history or meaningful political debate. And three, that cute uh, black African children are the only beings worth caring about in Africa. Now these assumptions are the bread and butter of the missionary or white savior industrial complex. Because without a full story with the nuance and context, uh, the, the fiction has to provide a clear villain, which is our violent, barbaric African, a clear victim, which is our cute African kid, and a location to act freely without pesky history and political debate. Okay? So it's perfect. It's a perfect story. Okay, so let's go back to connecting those dots again, and we're going to move into contextualizing and historicizing the conflict in northern Uganda. Okay, and I'm going to do this by, by just tracing out briefly six chapters of this conflict. Okay, the first one is in 1986 when President of Uganda, Museveni, became uh, victorious in his, uh, he used to be a rebel himself, was, six, was uh, victorious in his insurgency. Uh, 1986, when the northern northern counterinsurgency started. 1986 to 2002, displacements in Acholiland. Uh, 
number four, between the mid-1990s and 2006, how the LRA starts to articulate itself and link itself to the conflicts in Sudan. Number five, the 2006 to 2008 peace talks that I referred to earlier that were held in Juba. And number six, uh, 2008 to today, the LRA in the Congo and the NCAR, uh, Central African Republic. Okay, so first of all, this is not a uh, kid-based conflict. This is a uh, historical conflict between groups in the north and groups in the south, okay? President Nisemini is from the south, he's from Mbale, which is down here, and then we've got Gulu in northern Uganda up there, okay? Uh, this is rooted in political power struggles. Uh, Museveni was uh, fighting, Museveni, who's now the president of Uganda, was fighting a rebel insurgency against a northern president, Obote. Um, and like I said, in 1986, he became uh, victorious and his, his insurgency won. So in 1986, Museveni was inaugurated in his military rebel fatigues. And, uh, and the national resistance movement becomes the main political party in Uganda, okay? So depending on who you talk to, the president of Uganda uh, is, can be looked at as a, uh, a former rebel leader, he can be seen as uh, the president of Uganda, or he can be seen as a dictator, okay, by a lot of people in the country. Okay, so immediately after uh, Museveni's uh, him winning his, the insurgency and coming to power, Northerners immediately started experiencing retribution for things that had happened during the fight prior to his win, okay? So uh, atrocities, killings, lootings, okay? And I, I've heard a zillion stories about this. Um, so as a result, people went back into the bush and a counterinsurgency was born. The first iteration of this conflict was called the Holy Spirit Movement. And it was led by a barren woman from Lalogi, which is right next to Odek, which is where Joseph Kony is from. I'm gonna start saying Kony because that's how you say it in uh, Acholi. Um, so I've been saying Kony because I know people are used to it, but I'm gonna start saying Kony because I'm uncomfortable saying that, uh, Kony. So, so yeah, so Alice Lequena was this barren woman from Lalogi, okay? And she also was uh, possessed by a spirit called uh, Lequena. Okay? And people believed in her spirits because she told them she had an ideology of Warcraft where they would uh, go naked and cover themselves with shea butter and run into battle with stones, sticks and stones. And I always get these images of my head of this band of naked, shining people with <laughs> sticks and stones, yeah? But they, but they were successful. And they actually went all the way down to Kampala and were stopped which you see in this map, it's Creek Korea, all the way down to Kampala, and then we're stopped just short of Kampala, okay? And at that point, her, uh, her sort of power started to diminish a little bit uh, because people thought, oh, the spirits lost its power, yeah? So what happened after that was her, fa uh, her father, Severino Lucoyo, picked up the, uh, the insurgency for about a year or so, and it was a very sort of, that was a part where it was definitely kind of senseless and a bit violent and in a way that, you know, but it was a short duration. After that, the third iteration is when Joseph Kahn comes into the picture, okay? And he is said to be your cousin. Uh, I'm not sure if that's true or not. Um, he they may have say, they may say that to lend some credibility to his uh, authority. But in any case, he took on this uh, insurgency. And just as an aside, Alice Lequena always predicted that there would be seven uh, iterations of the conflict. I don't know if people believe that or not anymore, but it's just kind of an interesting kind of thing. So are we on, I don't know what iteration we're on, but. <laughs> um, okay. So as part of a military strategy, the government of Uganda forcibly displaced 1.6 million Acholi. That's the ethnic group in the north. Uh, they did this through, uh, you know, gunpoint, killings, uh, lootings, and harassment and threats. Why did they do this? Why did the government of Uganda, the military of Uganda, displace a whole ethnic group, 
1.6 million people. For one reason they did it because they wanted to clearly delineate between the rebels and the civilians, okay? So you cleared the civilians off the countryside and then whoever was outside of the camps was thought to be a rebel potentially and they could be dealt with accordingly, okay? Another reason was when people were out of the camps, they were producing food and the rebels would go and loot food from the fields and so this was a way that they could sustain themselves. So stopping food production then was another way that they thought they could stop the rebel movement. Okay, the problem with stopping food production was it stopped food production for everyone. Okay, and I think at first the government of Uganda thought that this thing was going to go on, the displacement was, they were going to get them quick, the LRA. Well, after six months, they, and people are stuck in these camps, they realized that um, they, people needed food. So the World Food Program came and started giving, the United Nations World Food Program came and started giving food to the camps. So in essence, interestingly enough, and we always think of food aid as a good thing, but here in this case, food aid was buttressing a policy in illegal forced displacement of 1.6 million people. And they supported this through supporting that camp system for over 12 years, okay? By the way, the U.S. government gives 60% of food aid to World Food Program, so that's where some of your taxpayers' dollars are going to. Now, a, a note about the camps. It wasn't just an issue of human rights in terms of being forcibly displaced. The situation in the camps was incredibly poor in terms of hygiene, uh, everything, any, any kind of, you know, food, even though they got food aid, it wasn't nutritious food. So as a result, there was uh, a huge amount of mortality rate. A thousand people a week were dying in the camps, okay? At the time when this study was done that, that where, they, where they got that figure, this was a, an Oxfam report, if I remember correctly, okay? So at the time when this, this uh, figure was released, I believe it was 2003, the Iraq war was going on and it was more casualties, it was a higher mortality rate than what was going on in Iraq at the time. So it's a bit startling to people, yeah? So, um, but it's important to note again that that huge uh, casualty rate, or mortality rate was not a result of the conflict itself it, or the violence of the LRA or the violence even of the, of the oh sorry, here comes my azan. <laughs> It wasn't because of the violence of the conflict itself, but rather because of the situation of the camps, okay? So any argument that's made about people dying because of the LRA or things like that, this is a bit of a fallacious argument to make, okay? It really was a result of the military, the Ugandan military, and their displacement of 1.6 million people. Okay, so finally, by around the mid-1990s, the LRA was starting to lose steam. Uh, people that had volunteered for the rebel movement uh, were, you know, kind of losing interest in this. Um, and so the LRA was on its last leg. So what happened was it ended up becoming uh, absorbed into the larger Sudanese quagmire, okay? So Khartoum ended up funding and supporting the LRA. They, they started being based in southern Sudan. Why did they do that? They did that because President Museveni was funding their insurgency group. The SPLA. Okay, so this was a tit for tat kind of thing. Okay, and as a result, they became armed, rearmed, and actually, this became a serious kind of war. So, this strategy of hiring insurgency groups or ethnic groups to kill other groups is a typical strategy of the Sudanese government. And you've all heard of Darfur. Okay, Darfur is they take certain tribes, which collectively are called the Janjaweed, who go and they they uh, kill other tribes in Sudan, right? So this is basically what was happening with the LRA. They were hired to basically wreak havoc in southern Sudan and in northern Uganda. And, and uh, just, oh, and yeah, there are, uh, there were at the time when I was there last in southern Sudan, there were about seven or eight insurgency groups like this. So the LRA is just one of many, okay? In that, that are being used in this way, in, in southern Sudan, or were being used in that way. Okay, so finally in 2005, the Comprehensive Peace Agreement 
between the Khartoum government and the South Sudanese rebels was signed. Okay, and this led to uh, a peace that was being brokered, which eventually ended up uh, leading to the independence of South Sudan, which happened last year. Okay? Um, so because of that, and to ensure the security and the success of the Southern Sudanese state, they uh, they uh, wanted to create peace in that region, okay? So that's why Southern Sudan then brokered these peace talks in Southern, in, uh, for the LRA, okay? So uh, LRA comes out of the bush, they all uh, relocate to South Sudan and assemble there, and meanwhile, Tone, uh, uh, relocates to the Congo, and this talk, these talks went on for two years. Meanwhile, while the peace talks were going on, President Museveni was slowly uh, assembling uh, military troops in the Congo, and it almost seems like he didn't really, he wasn't really serious about the peace talks in some respects, okay? And so as soon as the peace talks failed, uh, he launched Operation Lightning Thunder to end the LRA militarily. Now the Congolese felt that there were other motivations at play. Uh, for one thing, as you all know, or maybe you don't, but Congo is full of resources. It's probably one of the most resource-rich areas of the world. Full of gold, diamonds, coltan, which is used for all of our electronics, cell phones, computers, I don't know, whatever, whatever's here, okay? <laughs> and, uh, and timber, okay? So uh, with Ugandan military operations located in the Congo where they still are, uh, comes uh, rapes looting, and all kinds of sort of undercover uh, businesses, okay? Which I actually got a huge window into this, a shocking kind of window into that this uh, summer. So, it's true. <laughs> so the Congolese government asked uh, the Ugandan government twice to leave, and they're still in the process of trying to push them out. So, they're not welcome there. Okay, so this whole argument in 2012 that the U.S. just don't support military, you got a military troops there is not supported by the Congolese, okay? Okay, so today uh, the LRA is still in the DRC Congo and in Sierra. They're scattered all over the region, um, and that's where we stand right now. Okay, so the problems with the Joseph Kony, their Kony portrayal in Kony 2012. Number one, Khan is not a threat in northern Uganda, unlike what the video tells us, okay? Uh, the, the big threats in northern Uganda right now are corporate land grabs that are going on, uh, where corporations are going in and literally grabbing land from people in that region, and, and once you lose your land, you, that's the road to permanent impoverishment, okay? So this is a very serious issue. Another very, very serious issue right now is a, a, a disease called nodding disease, uh, which uh, is afflicting people in, the epicenter of it is Odak and Lelogi, if you remember those names, who's from there? Joseph Cohen and Alice Lapointe, right? Okay, so there's a whole, uh, you know, kind of a conspiracy theory in Northern Uganda right now that people don't really tell you until they know you very well, but, um, but that, you know, somehow, did the government of Uganda the water supply there. There's, you know, there's a lot of sort of people don't know what this is about. It, it's a bit of a weird coincidence, is it not? So, you know, this is another issue, and it afflicts children between the ages of uh, uh, seven and uh, twelve. Okay, so it's a very, very weird, and it almost kind of mirrors a epileptic kind of uh, seizure, but it's a bit odd. So the WHO, the World Health Organization, is on top of that right now. Okay, second problem. As, I, as I've kind of expressed to you already, Khan was never the bad guy in the area, unlike what that video describes. Um, everyone uses child soldiers in this region, okay? Including the government of Uganda. The Ugandan military, as I just told you, also engages and has engaged in the past in atrocities, okay? not unlike the LRA. In fact, during the conflict, it was unclear who was perpetrating the atrocities more. Was it the LRA or was it the Ugandan military? It was unclear, okay? And like
like I said earlier, just a few weeks ago, there was another report of uh, looting and raids in the Congress. So the Ugandan military is not pure here by any stretch of the imagination, nor are any of these groups. Kong is a small player in a large network of conflict, okay? Part of the reason that the AU is not going, the African Union is not going after Kong in a sort of forceful way is there are much bigger, uh, the AU is sort of a, a confederation of member states, okay? There is no buy-in from those member states, the affected regions, okay? Congo, uh, Sudan, and uh, other, other places in the area, CAR, okay? In Congo, they have chronic instability in the Kivus. Uh, Kabila uh, fears that Angola and Congo Brazzaville are supporting his opponents. Uh, so his eyes are directed that way. CAR is concerned about rebel groups in the north. And then South Sudan, if you've been paying attention, is in the middle of, I don't know what's going to happen there. But there's a border dispute going on uh, between the north and the south. And there's renewed war in, in South Cordoban and uh, Blue Nile. Okay. And an important thing to remember here, too, is that Cohen is just a symptom of a lack of democracy. If you get rid of him, another person's going to emerge. And if I were going to take bets on this, I'd say uh, the if a, uh, you know another insurgency was going to rise up, it might even come from the south, and it might even come from the place where Museveni's from. Okay, there's widespread dissent right now in that region. So if none of this kind of makes any sense to you, why we're even talking about this? Or why, why, did, why was there such a big discussion about this? If things don't make sense, it's always important to ask the question, Kui Bene, who benefits? Okay? Well, first of all, Museveni benefits. He gets his foothold in the, in the Congo. Uh, it deflects attention away from his human rights violations. Some of you may have heard uh, already, I talked about the displacement of 1.6 million people as a military strategy. Recently, the Ugandan uh, government has proposed the death penalty for homosexuals, okay? The kind of stuff that goes on in a place where democracy is weak or non-existent, okay? The kind of stuff that dictators do. So allying himself with the U.S. in this particular case uh, helps him to keep hold of his power, okay? Of his 26-year dictatorship. Now, why does the U.S. support uh, President Museveni. Anyone have any guesses? I'm sorry? They think he's a good guy. They don't you know, see the whole picture. I think they kind of know. Oh, yeah? The Syria is not that close. Okay. Because the Uganda is a frontline nation on terror. Okay, that's still a big part of our foreign policy objective is to, you know, stamp out um, uh, terror. Terror. Terrorism. Okay. So, uh, Osama bin Laden actually was once a sponsored by the Sudanese government. Al-Qaeda operatives are all over in that region from Somalia down into the Congo, and there's a huge uh, sort of small arms trade that runs through that region, okay? So this is a very, very important region for the United States, and obviously they're not friends with Sudan, they're not friends with anybody in that region, so they've got to stay friends with Uganda. That's their best bet, the U.S. Okay. ICC, the International Criminal Court. Uh, this was their first case. It was poorly thought out. One of the ICC investigators told me that we're making this up as we go along. Okay? So um, so this case has become a craw on the side of the ICC and they want this done. Okay? So if Coney yeah, 2012 was successful in making the case for this, they could you know, go forward and get this out of their, their way, this case. Okay, who else benefits? U.S. and AFRICOM. The argument is that the AU, like I said, is not uh, taking care of their own problems, so we have to go in and do that. Okay, and I already told you that the AU is not doing it because they've got other issues. The member states don't care about this issue as much. Okay? So if there's no buy-in from the people who are there again, why does the U.S. care to intervene? Okay? Well, one thing, just like Museveni, uh, the U.S. Uh, government wants to have a foothold in areas where there are 
uh, resources that are important for their for the U.S.'s uh, national security. Okay, uh, gold and diamonds and timber might not be it so much, but coltan for sure is. Okay, because the uh, the, the tech sector, the electronic sector is huge here. It's very very important to us economically. Okay, it's a driver of the economy now. So it's very important that we keep coltan prices low in order to keep our economy running and humming. Okay. So those of you who think that Africa is a poorer place, think again. It's one of the richest places in the world in terms of resources. Okay. Last but not least, invisible children benefits from this. Um, personally, I don't think these guys are corrupt. Um, they are fueled with a sense of purpose and are good people. Okay. But in this using this uh, 2012 kind of strategy, they are able to expand their goal to get American youth involved and giving them a sense of purpose, okay? One of the followers of, uh, well, this uh, Invisible Children is the largest uh, student activism group in the country, and Invisible Children has uh, created the largest uh, group that advocates for an African cause ever. It's the largest group ever, okay? It's larger than any group to advocate on behalf of even Darfur, which all of you have heard about. It's a bit under the radar in a way, though, why? Because it's all young people, okay? This is the largest group. Uh, one of the students that uh, was involved in Invisible Children that I met in Gulu said, this is our Vietnam. So this is, they want that sense of we're doing something to change the world, yeah? Uh, one of the filmmakers said to me once, uh, in a lot of ways, this Invisible Children is more about America than it is about Uganda. And I think a lot of people would agree with that. Indeed, their stance does not go over well in northern Uganda. The few people that did see the video, there was a showing in uh, northern Uganda, and uh, the Ugandan audience threw rocks at the screen. Okay? So it is more a message for Americans than it is for Uganda. So in a sense, Invisible Children, as one of my friends put it, is uh, they're a group, they're useful idiots, okay? Because they pave the way for larger interests. So if there's so many effects, why do I say that Coney 2012 doesn't matter? Well, I say this because Coney 2012 in itself is not a powerful threat, but rather this larger missionary white savior industrial complex that Coney 2012 is a part of is already paving the way for these types of interventions in Africa anyway. Okay, through these decontextualizing and dehistoricizing uh, fictive one-dimensional narratives. So anytime you see the Nick Kristoffs, the Bonos, the Angelina Jolies, the Doctors Without Borders, yes I said that, and Save the Children's um, and you're supporting that, you're part, they're all part of this. They're all part of this complex, okay? So if you feel your, your heart getting tugged, especially if there's a picture of a little black baby in the, <laughs> in the plea, I suggest you do four things. First of all, take a deep breath. Second of all, count to 10. Third of all, switch your brain on. And fourth, start reading and asking critical questions. The fact that Coney 2012 gave me and other educators the opportunity to even say this to you is the only reason that this matters to me. So, in order, if some of you are interested in this, there are several critical responses to Coney 2012. And I list my two favorites up here. I'll, I'll show one of them. Um, the other, the, uh, so those are the two up there, and if anybody's interested in those, I can send those out. We can do an email list or something like that. Okay, uh, but but actually, all these things are listed on uh, in response to the Coney 2012 video. Uh, a group of uh, scholars uh, all over the world that work in northern Uganda came together and created this website called Making Sense of Coney, and I was the one of the organizers of this. Um, so there's a website now that kind of where we put all these critiques together and we also 
uh, generated statements from people who work there. We didn't want to make one general statement because then we'd we be falling into a one-dimensional narrative as well. Okay, so we ended up creating this website where people can go and read and we have uh, frequently asked questions. And if you're interested, take a look at it. You can do a search on it, Making Sense of Coney and, uh, or Cone, and then you can, you know, you can read more about it. Um, another thing that happened was we created an ebook uh, called Beyond Coney 2012, and uh, that also has chapters. I wrote one of the chapters in there. Uh, it focuses more on, on invisible children's intervention in the region. Um, but it's also a really good place to get a background on this and then to understand what I mean. And I just touched on it today because I don't have enough time to talk about it more. But this, uh, you know, missionary industrial complex or white savior industrial complex. Uh, and so you can get more of a sense of the implications of that and why it's not okay to just have good intentions. Okay. So take a look at those uh, if you're interested in this, in this topic. And I'm just going to show one thing if I can.
the dogs still supporting Bella? Probably. We're not sure. Uh, there, when I was in Gulu, there were some rumors that Khan was in Darfur. So I don't know if they. Again, they, at this point, it's kind of a survival thing. So they're kind of, you know, I think they are kind of guns for hires right now. They are. Um, but if you go and you know interviews that they've had with Khan, he still is very focused on. In the seventies, a dictator, they're fighting for democracy. I mean, there's some uh, questions about. I still have a hard time to understand why he wants to free his own people, but at the same time, the actual people are not people are not the Well, it, it has a lot to do with the issue of Sudan coming into play, right? So, yeah, they're but it's not they're not pure. No one, there's no sight of purity here. No, I hope. Yes, yeah, so I'm not going to try to explain what the LRA is up to in, in some respects, right? Yeah. Uh, but I think that if you think of it in terms of there's a there is a there is a political mission, uh, but like all of us, uh, we take detours sometimes for the sake of preservation, right? I think that's what's been happening, and maybe it's gone on a little too long. But any other questions? What about strengthening the power of women to overcome all of these sides? Yeah. Because it's generally men that are involved in the complex, women and children, um, you know, that are that are hurt. So in the conflicts, so um, like in Libya, um, where the where the women did take control and sort of um, you know worked on that. So just just something to help women. I mean, because it's like you said, you can't really pick sides. There are no innocent sides here. Everybody's at fault. But just as a um, yeah. Okay, I I, um, I feel like that kind of an argument um, lapses into exactly what I'm talking about, that somehow there's some side of purity somewhere. Okay. Um, and women and kids are often the sides of purity that are used to, uh, you know, by this sort of, this missionary industrial complex. It's, 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 it's oftentimes, you know, in the end, it, it's, it's, you know, women are, are people too, okay? And we have a huge, uh, spectrum of people who want to do bad things and good things and want to do both bad and good things and so I don't think that our hope rests uh, just in uh, empowering women. I think that is really, really um, we're lapsing the same exact mentality with that. I think. Not to say we shouldn't yeah, but. Yeah, because we do know that when we educate men, they generally empower themselves and get more women. When we educate women, they tend to educate their families and their communities more. There's more I do believe that women globally, there's more of a sharing mentality than there is in males. And I think that that's a discourse that's perpetuated by Nick Kristoff and, and all really these like folks. Nick Kristoff. I don't He's very even. finger pointing. Okay, but, but yeah. that that this kind of thing that somehow you know there's a site of purity somehow. Yeah, I don't. I so don't I think we have to be really that. critical about that woman thing too. But I like the I like the idea. We have to empower women, people of color, whoever is marginalized. Yeah, whatever well, marginal group. I screw. And I think education for everyone. What we do know is that the world is actually less violent in spite of everything we see. There's less violence and less deaths, and that is because we have gotten people are getting more educated. Right. And it just seems like educating women, when you when you have limited, again, resources for education, it seems to go further when you devote it to women. But I do believe education and democracy. Okay, is but be critical, be a critical thinker about that too, because yeah. that's also a huge discourse that's perpetuated yeah, I don't like by the pennies, guys. the pennies for that, that's another thing. No, but this discourse about women somehow are the hope for the whole world. Yeah. Women are people too, let's not forget that. Yeah. And we all have this, you know, potential for good and evil Put in, in us as people, yeah? So it's not essentialized what a woman is either. Yeah. yeah. Um, have you seen Machine Gun Preacher? I haven't. Um, but I. Is it another example of the missionary industrial? Would you say, or that would be maybe another? I, I haven't seen the movie. I know who he is. He he works in southern Sudan. I was actually in that town. Yeah. In he, from from the film that they the cinema that came out, they say that um, he went over there and established like church and a place for children, right. the night markers would stay, and yeah. he defends it, he's there, he causes more violence, and it was a very interesting film, um, but I'd like to... Yeah, um, I, I would say, I, again, I don't know what he does, but it, it, you know, obviously is part of that whole mentality, yeah. of somehow, you know, I have to, you know, he feels this, this impetus to go to Africa to do this work, 
Yeah. It, 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 it sort of smells a little bit like it does. That's why I was that whole larger it. thing. Yeah. So yeah. It's the same thing can be said about anthropologists too, going and observing and not doing anything to change things. Sure. Let's just observe, not get involved, and it's very important. It's very Korean important thing. that somebody doesn't do stuff yeah. and actually pays mind to uh, paying attention to what's going on and being critical about it and not getting involved in stuff. It's very important that some people do that. Okay, but I agree with you. We have our our problems too. Yeah. So one, one more question, and then we have to wrap up. The, the lecture ends at twelve fifty, so you folks can go off to class. One more question. Yeah. Yeah. Um, finding all that. All the history that you brought up, taking that all the way back, um, was it hard to come around that history, or was that just something you could look up rather easily? Um, because I know, like, um, we talk a lot about um, in taking your class too. When we talk about an issue, we try to find like the root all the way back from history where it stems. Right. And I just want to know how hard it is to do that in every context, like everything that you look up, everything that you talk about. Um, Talking about security and future studies. Jim, you want to say a couple words and then uh, uh, you're I can free guarantee to go. you.